Our last speaker before the coffee break will be Scott Doney, and he's going to be uh, giving us an overview of uh, the science behind export science question three. Thanks, Adrian. So Mary Jane and Adrian have set me up quite nicely in terms of showing current views of science for both the upper ocean and the twilight zone. And I wanted to talk a little bit more about where we are in terms of modeling and predictability. And in particular, the sub-question three in the export science plan, with, with, whose goal is to improve our confidence in model estimates of both contemporary and future uh, export and its fate of NPP in the ocean. And the sub-question breaks down into four levels. The first three are involved with looking at our mechanistic understanding. So sub-question 3A is how do we put together our best estimate for models of predicting using mechanistic and process models export and fate. The second sub-question 3B is are there surface properties that we then can glean from that that then would feed into remote sensing estimates. So A is everything, B is are there surface properties that give us information and they can be physical, biological surface properties, and then C is which of those could be used for remote sensing, and if remote sensing then needs to be augmented with in situ data uh, from autonomous vehicles, for example, moving forward beyond exports to keep a, a record of how well we can monitor and constrain contemporary uh, export. The, th the fourth component, sub-question 3D, is really improving estimates and prediction for the future. So it's integrating all of the above information with prognostic models moving forward under a changing global system. How is export going to evolve? Now, there's going to be a hierarchy of data synthesis and modeling. Uh, that builds off the rich export data sets, both from ship-based measurements and from autonomous vehicles, remote sensing, as well as some of the other, um, like comics that Adrian mentioned, as well as historical data sets. Those would feed into statistical and diagnostic models, and I'll show some examples of that. They would, they would then also feed into prognostic and mechanistic models. And then both the diagnostic approaches and the process level models would integrate into prognostic models that would be used for uh, the future predictions as well as contemporary state. I'm going to divide the talk up into two sections, so the upper ocean export part that Mary Jane talked about, and then a uh, second part on the twilight zone, touching on Adrian's work. So I'm just going to start with a few examples of some of these diagnostic uh, and statistical approaches. So this is um, basically the broad approach. If you start in the upper left, this is some sort of calibration data set. In this case, this is net community production estimates from oxygen argon data, uh, some global distribution. Uh, that's then compared to observables. So for example, in this case, chlorophyll, but you could compare it to lots of other observables. You then combine the information from this comparison to observables into some sort of statistical algorithm. There's lots of different ways from very simple regressions to very advanced statistical techniques. And this is just showing a comparison of the model versus the data for two different algorithms. And there's still a lot of, it, a lot of scatter, but it's sort of given that calibration data set, that's the best you can do, and then you apply it to broadly to other conditions. So this is from that same, that same paper from Lee and Kassar. This is comparing their different algorithms to about a dozen other diagnostic approaches that have been developed, either satellite algorithm based or al satellite data combined with, um, uh, with some sort of diagnostic model. And if you squint broadly, they're all yellow and green and blue. They're all on the same color bar. Uh, but if you look closely, there are lots of differences between the different approaches. Uh, places very low values in the tropics in some models versus uh, models that have considerably higher export in the tropics, for example. Now, some of this is a lack of information. We just don't have enough data to constrain all of these different approaches. Some of it is they've used different, uh, different observations, different calibration data sets 
that are telling us different things about export and productivity. Oxygen argon doesn't necessarily tell you the same thing as thorium-234. And that's one approach. The other is that there's a, a real lack in this of a lot of mechanistic understanding. We're trying to build that direction, but we still lack many of the basic mechanisms that Mary Jane was talking about folding into these models. One thing that's moving forward is trying to combine more statistical approaches with some information on dynamics in, in a diagnostic form. This is just one example where this model uses uh, remote sensing information on net primary production, stocks of different phytoplankton, and then size class that might influence the behavior of export from these different production pathways. Uh, it uses information on the change of these stocks over time, along with primary production to get to grazing rates, and it results in two export pathways, an algal export of large cells, so this would be a large cell pathway, and then a small cell pathway that have to go through zooplankton in order to get fecal pellets, so there's fecal pellets being produced from both small phytoplankton and large phytoplankton. This is just showing the calibration or evaluation curve against uh, thorium-234 as a measure of export from the upper ocean. This is showing the results from a global application, uh, the total export that I showed before from that previous plot, but then you can start to look at export ratios, so seasonal and geographic variations in how much of the productivity is actually export because of variations in, say, the small pathway versus the large pathway, rates of grazing. Um, you can start to integrate in dynamic information and as well as looking at these two pathways where in this particular application, al the export of large algal cells tends to dominate at high latitudes. So that's the diagnostic model. How are we doing on the prognostic case? Um, there's a a group of us who've been working in the marine ecosystem model in our comparison project that are trying to take earth system models and global ocean models that have ecosystems, try to bring them together, compare them against each other, and also compare them against observations. A couple of very nice papers by Charlotte Lofcotter. She's here in the audience and can answer questions in more detail. Uh, these upper four here are four different earth system prognostic models. Uh, this is their export flux. So, Similarly to diagnostic, we have large variation in what our models are suggesting for export flux. These are two observational data sets, so you know, we don't have a truth that we can then drive the models towards. There's as much uncertainty in our ob observational estimates as there are in the prognostic models, but this is still rather worrisome that we get such different patterns. The other thing that's worrisome is when you take these models and then run them through a climate scenario, you know, a warmer ocean, a more acidic ocean, a more stratified ocean in the future, you get large differences in the behavior. So for example, in this model, it suggests that exports are actually gonna go up in the tropical eastern Pacific where this model says it's actually gonna go down. And although there are some similarity in the patterns, there are large differences in how these models are gonna respond in the future, what really uh, contributes to our uncertainty in predicting the future state of the global carbon cycle. Now you can drill down a little bit into these models and say, well, how can you aggregate and look at the overall behavior or dynamics of these models? So for export, you're taking net primary production, you're forming particulate organic carbon, and then some of that particulate organic carbon sinks. And so in addition to just looking at export ratio going to, from net primary production to export flux, you can also look at the, basically the particle production component and the sinking component. And what you can see, these are just showing again these four models, this is high latitude, this is low latitude, the four models, is even for models that have the same effective export ratio, they might be getting it for very different reasons. This model is very efficient at forming particles, some sink out. This model is not very effective at forming particles, but they all sink out. So there's very little remineralization in the upper ocean. So even just similarities in how we're getting export really points to the lack of mechanistic understanding that's being folded into these models. And of course, everybody will say, oh, but we have great data sets, and yes, the modeling community, there's a, a time lag 
but we're still lacking enough mechanistic information to really calibrate and evaluate these models. Uh, one last, and then I'll, I'll switch gears to the twilight zone. Another way of sorting this out is, is sort of canonical paradigm of size class. A lot of these models now have size class structure at a very simple level. Uh, this is just a, a lumping it into two size classes or types, a diatom, which might be viewed as a large, contributes to rapid sinking, larger zooplankton, leading to more fecal pellets, versus a small nanophytoplankton, um, leading to export. So this is now the same four models. So the mo four models this direction, this is low latitude in this column, high latitude in this column. And what you see is even simple things like how much of the standing stock is diatoms, large plankton versus small plankton, we're all over the map in the models. Similarly, with the contribution in size of zooplankton to phytoplankton, so the yellow box to the green boxes, and then the export pathways, you know, big arrows versus small arrows. Some of this is, again, this lag and how well the modeling groups uh, are following the observational data sets, but some is better understanding, lack of understanding of how we're setting up uh, the fundamental set of rules that drives these are out as outcomes. These are not set up within the models. They're outcomes of the parameterizations and the model parameters that are used in the simulations. Now, moving to the twilight zone. If you think the upper ocean is bad in the models, um, so take this upper ocean version. Now we're interested in, in the fate. And I'm going to start with the sinking particle fluxes uh, because that's what's best captured has been a target for many of these models. There's sort of two things that it, it, in big scheme that the models might be interested in. One is how quickly does material, um, how quickly is material removed in the upper few hundred meters right below whatever export depth you're going to set? The other is how much of the material makes it into the deep ocean? <coughs> So this might be the, the, the remineralization link scale. So Adrian showed you could either set it up as a Martin curve with a B exponent, or you could set it up as an exponential link scale. But we might be interested in this link scale and also this transfer efficiency, how much gets to the deep ocean. Because of a lack of data until recently, most of the models have been compared primarily to, uh, in terms of export fluxes, and then the next thing would be deep sediment trap data. So this is a compilation, goes back to Lutz et al., and then before that, Honjo et al., a compilation of deep sediment trap data that's been used for a lot of model comparisons. This is then just a comparison for a particular diagnostic for a satellite diagnostic export at 2,000 meters versus deep sediment trap. Uh, broad similarity, but still a lot of scatter in the results. Uh, Adrian already showed this, so I just want to show he had mentioned that um, although there's some work that suggests that these uh, link scales should scale with temperature, another model shows almost the exact opposite pattern. So some models are suggesting that in warm environments you should get a lot of the remineralization right close to the surface ocean. Others are saying the exact opposite. And so we really need to work on the mechanisms that are driving this Temperature is only one of the f factors. Adrian mentioned there's a whole series of rich literature on ballasting, on particle size, on composition that could affect these link scales. This is just showing from one model, this is uh, that transfer efficiency. So how much of the material that, say, leaves 100 meters makes it down to 2,000 meters. You see large regional variations with a, lot of, a large transfer velocity here in the uh, subtropical North Atlantic, uh, much lower in the Pacific. In this particular model, in addition to temperature, uh, this also includes, includes ballasting effects and composition effects. So this is a dust-driven, Saharan dust-driven transfer efficiency where you get a lot of dust out into that region and it, it protects or, or ballasts the organic matter sinking to the ocean. Uh, this is a model result. Whether this is real, we really need to we really need some work on similar patterns on how much makes it to depth and that link scale. Um, I have to show some early work from Merimip now looking. I showed earlier export flux. 
Uh, there's also an analysis going on looking at transfer through the, the ocean. And what you can see is wide variations between the models. So for example, in this model, there's a lot of seasonal variability and almost none of the organic matter makes it below, say, six or 700, 800 meters. Where in another, in, in, for example, this model, there's a fraction that makes it all the way down into the deep ocean. And these differences have huge effects on the ability of these models to simulate um, ocean carbon cycle and the sensitivity of the ocean to changes in biological export. There's been some very nice work, uh, Quan et al., Marinoff et al., this is just one figure showing how changes in this E-folding link scale as you get, this is shallow remineralization, this is deep remineralization, have big impacts on air sea CO2 partitioning. So the more organic carbon that gets deep in the ocean, the lower the atmospheric CO2 levels. I should say most of the models out there right now are using empirical approaches, but there are some really interesting uh, process level models. There's a rich history of particle process models, aggregation models, uh, going back several decades. This is just a recent paper I pulled off that's a stochastic Lagrangian aggregate model, where they have little particles of different types that are then captured in aggregates. You run this many, many, many times, sort of think of it as a Monte Carlo type simulation, and then you can look at the impact of different parameters, say, for example, stickiness or bacterial res respiration or how much TEP there is, um, and it has big impacts both on flux and flux as export and then flux to the seafloor. And I think one of the things that exports could do is help us build up a better mechanistic understanding, take these kind of process models and incorporate them either directly or as parameterizations into Earth system models. Remember right now, many of the models are just using a, a fixed empirical link scale. We really don't have this process level information or food web information. Um, just quickly to touch on the other pathways, uh, there is a physical transport pathway. This was mentioned in Mary Jane's talk. Um, all of the Earth system models, because they're 3D ocean circulation models, they do have some pathways for exporting material. This, you know, go back to the original ocean carbon model inter comparison projects, some of Ray Najar's work. Um, dissolved organic carbon would build up in the surface layer and then would be export to depth. The problem is these models are very coarse resolution. They don't capture the richness at the mesoscale or the sub-mesoscale, <coughs> and we're probably not doing a particularly good job. There is some really interesting work going on on this. This is uh, a recent paper by Marianna Levy, and I'll let Marianna answer questions at the break in detail. But I just wanted to show this. This is a nice a global analysis where green is the sinking, the biological transfer, red is the physical transport of organic matter out of, across the base of the mixed layer. So this is, this is subduction, it's diapycnal mixing, it's all the richness of physical transport. We can do these from the global models right now, but I don't have a lot of confidence, uh, particularly if a lot of this is at the sub scale, which we need to parameterize uh, and isn't treated well in the models. The last pathway I wanted to mention was the dial vertical migration. Um, at least at the Earth system model level, uh, models tend to not incorporate this as a parameterization. This is not a pathway that they typically predict. Uh, but there is some interesting process level modeling. This is a paper from a few years ago from Bianchi that had a, a food web model that had sort of small and large zooplankton where the large zooplankton were actually some of them were migrators, so they were transporting uh, effectively organic matter to depth. Their respiration and their release of particles at depth uh, led to a respiration burden, and that's in red, and that could be compared to the background uh, particulate organic carbon respiration that you might think of from a sinking, sinking aggr aggregates and fecal pellets. The interesting about the migrators is they go down to a particular depth. So at the depth that they're migrating to, you get a large influence in that region because of the migration. This sort of information can start to be incorporated, but we need a lot more mechanistic understanding. 
So I'll just wrap up with some summaries. I think in the surface ocean, we have a, a growing field of diagnostic and prognostic models uh, still lack a lot of the mechanistic understanding and a lot of disagreement between the models. It's even worse in the mesopelagic where we're still using, particularly in the global scale models, primarily empirical approaches and haven't even incorporated some of the key pathways such as dial vertical migration. I'm going to stop there. Um, we're going to take questions after Megastapa's talk. So it's 20 minutes of the hour. So what we're going to do is come back at 11, so a slightly shorter coffee break. Um, for those on the web, so that'll be 11 o'clock Eastern time. Megastapa will talk at, talk at 11, and then at 11.30, we'll have a discussion period for the audience as well as people out in the virtual internet. So thank you.